Uh, all right. We are start. We are ready to start. All right. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming here, and welcome to this day zero of the IGF Kyoto 2023. My name is Luca Belli. I'm professor at FGV Law School, and together with Henriette Esther Husen, I will uh, co-moderate this session on digital commons for digital sovereignty. We have a very good selection of speakers today. Uh, we will start with Renata Mielli, who is the coordinator of the uh, Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, the CGI Ponto BR, and works at the Ministry of Science and Technology of Brazil. Unfortunately, Renata Avila could not join us because she was our remote uh, speaker and she had a last minute uh, problem. Uh, we will have then Leah Gimpel, that is AI and Country Policy Lead at the Digital Public uh, Policy, sorry, Digital Public Goods Alliance in Germany. Sorry. Uh, then we will have Anita Guomurti, that is the Executive Director of IT for Change, India. And then we will have uh, uh, Francisca Putz, from, that is Senior Adv Advocacy Manager at Wikimedia. And then, last but of course not least, Carlos Baca from uh, uh, CITSAC, uh, is the General Coordinator of CITSAC Mexico. All right, uh, before we start, uh, this uh, fifth edition of the Internet Commons Forum, that is a, uh, let's say, a, a play on the Internet Governance Forum, is the Internet Commons Forum, because some years ago we felt that there was a lot of interesting discussions at the IGF, but very few discussions on digital commons, and so we started to have this uh, revolutionary Day Zero event on Internet Commons, that we are something we are uh, bringing on since uh, 2018, if I'm not mistaken, yes. And uh, in, during these five years, we, together with Henriette and other friends from APC, we have try, tried to feed this discussion about uh, digital commons, internet commons, and their relation with several topics every year. The topic of this year is uh, digital sovereignty, and I would like to just spend a couple of minutes now to introduce the debate so that people understand what we are speaking about when we speak about digital commons and what we want to speak about when we speak about digital sovereignty. On the digital commons part, uh, it's very important to understand that we are not only speaking about a type of resource, we are speaking about, about a type of management a type uh, of governance, actually. It's a governance that links the resource with the community. So it's, it's a way of management, if you want, if you're a way of management also of digital uh, resources. Uh, it's something that is alternative to the traditional way of managing states and markets, but is complementary. A very good uh, example, well, we will see a lot of examples, but a very good example on which I've worked a lot over the past years is community networks that are local networks built by unconnected community to create their own connectivity and so to manage connectivity, local services, local content uh, according to the need of the community, so for the community. It's a very good example of how even digital uh, resources can be built and managed by local communities. And this actually brings us to a very core pillar of what we can uh, see as digital sovereignty, which is not digital sovereignty in terms of uh, authoritarian control, censorship, uh, or social control. It's digital uh, sovereignty. It's another issue on which uh, I've been working a lot over the past years, especially in, uh, in the context of the BRICS a group of countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, where it is evident that, it is not only, uh, uh, that social control is only one part of digital sovereignty. There is another important pillar, which is what I call good digital sovereignty, which is about understanding the technology, developing the technology, and regulating the technology. None of this is controversial. None of this is controlling people. It's understanding how the technology works to be able to develop it, not only being a consumer, but also a producer of technology. It's very much uh, a question of self-determination, as we were speaking with Henriette a lot. 
and being able, able to regulate it. If you are a state, you can regulate it. If you are a local community that develops its own community network, you define norms. And actually, I want to stress this point because if we read the literature on commons, uh, Eleanor Olstrom won a Nobel Prize discussing and doing research on commons. And what the key point, the key consideration of Eleanor Ostrom was precisely that this management system is very performing, works very well, as long as you have a governance. You have rules, including rules uh, that define how to deal when people try to abuse of the commons or disrespect the common governance framework, right? So today we, will, we have a lot of good case studies to understand how this plays out, not only with the community networks, but also with Wikipedia, with a lot of different uh, type of, uh, of uh, initiatives, and also how states are starting to understand this, which is very important because the commons by themselves may be very fragile, may not be able, a commons movement alone may not be able to counter, uh, to create a counter narrative to very large and well resourced uh, corporations or state, and so it's very good that state try to understand this alternative system to try to foster it and protect it. Having said that, I now give the floor to Henriette for her initial uh, introduction, and then we will start with the first speaker, Renata. Um, and um, thanks for everyone um, for being here. Um, as Luca says, we've been working with this concept for the last few years, and I think that that what we are really trying to do is to identify what it is that is broken in internet governance. Um, Vint Cerf always says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I always say to him, but actually, Vint, it is broken. And, and, and I think that that's the challenge that we're dealing with in internet governance. We, we, we have models that try to, to increase more um, transparency. We have, have we trying to create uh, um, paradigms that are not shaped by control. We're trying to prevent abuse of power by, by governments, abuse of power by corporations. But we're actually failing. And then when we have something like the Global Digital Compact that really just illustrates how you might put fantastic new principles emphasize human rights, emphasize um, digital inclusion or access, but you're placing those principles on top of a fundamental approach to internet governance which is flawed. And I think that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find something that can really change how we think about what the internet is, what its essential character and nature is, to establish it as a commons. And, and based on that, then explore what are the different legal, economic, and governance um, implications of governing the internet as a commons. And so every year we, we explore different aspects of that. But personally, I really believe fundamentally that if we don't grapple with this, and if we can't shift the paradigm at this level, we will always be working with multi-stakeholder processes as a label but not, in fact, as a transformative approach to, to making governance more, more inclusive. And I think just finally, I think the, the really important emphasis here is this is not about sovereignty of states. It might be with regard to some aspects of governing the Internet as a commons, but it's also about self-determination. It's about giving people more control. It's about giving communities and content creators um, more control. So it is, in fact, really striving towards a, a fundamental shift in how we think about the internet and how we hopefully will one day govern it. Excellent. And so we have we start to see that there is a lot of uh, various dimensions that interact and intersect. And uh, we have we are very happy to have a very different range of uh, stakeholders represented here today and also to have a very good uh, feminine representation of stakeholders, which is always something we have to strive to do and to, and to implement, uh, not only paying lip services to gender balance, but also doing it with concrete deeds. And uh, it, we are also very happy to have Renata Mielli, who is now working for the Brazilian government, and he has, she has been working a lot on these kind of issues from a civil society perspective for many years. And it's very interesting to also to understand which kind of thinking uh, it's evolving uh, uh, in the new 
Brazilian administration that, as you may already know, is very different from the previous one and uh, to many extents in a very positive way. And so let's see uh, what is the current thinking at the Brazilian government and at the CGI that also uh, Renata represents in, in her double hat. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Luca, for inviting me to participate in this section. I think it's very important to us to talk about sovereignty in internet, and I would like to uh, uh, thanks to be here with Lia, Anita, Francisca, Carlos, Ariete, to to talk about this. Um, well, uh, we are living in a world where the internet, digital technologies, artificial intelligence, and the development of critical infrastructure are central to economic growth in our countries. In this digital era, there is a particular element that binds all these economic chains together and makes them functional, data. Without a substantial amount of data, none of these technologies make sense. And I think if we talk about sovereignty, digital sovereignty, we have to talk about data. Countries that have the capacity to produce these technologies and data, and who create effective regulatory frameworks to harness this digital ecosystem for the public good, will be able to assume leadership positions in the world and reduce their dependence on others. However, in recent years, these goals have seemed distant for many countries in the global south due to deepening technological asymmetries. These disparities are not only concentrated in a few countries, but, but also in a handful of companies, leading, leading to the increasing privatization of digital develop, development. Of course, we are talking about the big techs, that are ubiquitous and that are concentrated in privatization, all the, uh, um, all the, the, all of our lives and economics and everything. In this scenario, what can we do? What kind of policies can we develop to enable our countries to achieve digital sovereign sovereignty? We need to become technology creators, like Luca said, rather than technologic consumers. We must understand how technology can be used to benefit our societies with the perspective that it can empower countries, but they can empower our, they can empower also people and reduce inequalities if they are designed with these goals in mind. An example is developing socially referenced applications to address real issues in communities. This is an important challenge that is related to, deve to develop development and encouragement of the use of existing services, such as passenger transportation and traffic engineering. Understanding the strategic importance of having our own solutions for these services, which can free us from dependence on applications like Uber and Waze, is crucial. This is because the use of these platforms collects essential data for the development of public services and public policies, which are currently controlled by international private companies. In Brazil, for example, we have some cities that are develop this, uh, his own um, uh, applications for uh, uh, transportation, and this is very important to start something in more um, uh, uh, global scale in Brazil. Having creative solutions for these types of services helps develop the digital economy chain and can bring more empowerment to the services providers associated with them. They can develop fa fair economic arrangements, such as cooperative models, for example. The, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, to achieve this, we must strengthen our national industries, universities, and research, research centers, but also reinforce the whole of the state. 
A strong state that promotes the digital economic change is essential. We need the public policies that bolster tech infrastructure in both the public and private sectors. A robust science and technology policy, clear goals for industrial innovation, and a reduction of dependence. Incentivize national technology usage. Promote the use of national technology and digital services while regulating the activities of big tech platforms and data usage. Prioritize uh, cybersecurity. Develop strong cybersecurity policies, including data protection standards, privacy regulations, and policies for data flow. And on the, on, the other hand, on the other hand, we need to address the challenges related to the connectivity and meaningful access for all people. Achieving digital sovereignty is the landscape will be a complex journey. But by implementing these strategies and policies, we can work towards a future where our countries have a greater control over their digital destinies. Another strategic topic for the discussion of digital sovereignty is linguistic and cultural diversity. The Internet Steering Committee in Brazil recently hosted the first Lusophone Internet Governance Forum, bringing together Portuguese-speaking countries to discuss the challenges of promoting multilingual, multilingualism on the Internet. This aspect becomes even more relevant at, the, at a time when artificial intelligence emerges as a new stage in the development of the digital economy. This is because generative AI models need to be fed with a large volume of data, and most of it is available in English. This is not only a language issue, but also pertains to the topics covered as language is related to a country's culture and identity. We need to tackle the challenge of seeking investments for processing large language models in Portuguese and in the other languages uh, to achieve a strong position in AI models. This is a matter, of course, of digital sovereignty too. And to finish my presentation, I would like to bring some, uh, an example of uh, a digital uh, initiative we have recently in Brazil that, for me, um, uh, uh, design what we are trying to say about uh, using our own uh, solution for the digital internet. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, PIX, a uh, payment system introduced in 2020. And uh, uh, a system, a payment system that was developed in Brazil and has since become the most popular payment method. It is user friendly and most importantly, transactions are tax free. The introduction of the services has had a significant impact on commerce, particularly for small and personal businesses, as it has made transactions more cost effective. Additionally, it has reduced the data concentration in the hands of major international financial companies, such as Visa and MasterCard. Uh, nowadays, we have uh, around 70% of uh, Brazilian people connected on the internet. And this is the same uh, 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 number of people that usually use the PICs to do transactions on the internet. Because you only have to, to have a, a bank account and a, a cellular phone, a, a cell phone, and a connection to do some tra transaction with PICs. And this is uh, something uh, important uh, to democratize the access of payment on the internet. This is only an example of something we developed in Brazil, and uh, it's an um, example of uh, a tech sovereignty, but there, there are other ones we can talk about later. And I think this is some uh, principle, some uh, points to start the discussion about how important it is to our countries 
be uh, more uh, activity and be more creativity and um, uh, produce their own technology solutions. Thank you very much, Luca, for the space. All right. Thank you very much for this, as indeed, yes, it's something uh, that uh, there are very few, um, a couple of points that I wanted to, to stress about what Renata was mentioning because are key to understand the direction that we should take also for this conversation. Uh, first of all, the fact that uh, it is interesting to understand and to discuss digital commons and both digital commons and digital sovereignty as a sort of counter narrative to the kind of very concentrated digital ecosystem that we all know we are witnessing now and over the past decade especially. Uh, digital commons are particularly interesting because they are uh, antithetical to the logic of uh, value accumulation and even uh, sort of uh, dependency creation, structural dependency creation that large uh, corporations try to uh, built on their ecosystems. And the second point that what Renata was mentioning, which is also something that we have been discussing a lot, is precisely the fact that also exists some elements that may be driven by local communities, like community networks. And by the way, I think we will speak a lot about this with, with uh, Carlos, and we will have an, an entire session on community networks and digital sovereignty, where we present this booklet on digital sovereignty and community networks on uh, Thursday. But it's also something that the state has a role to play in, and the fact that you, the state can also uh, foster some example of digital sovereignty, like the PICS in Brazil. You have the, in, in India, we ha you, we ha you have UPI, which is a similar uh, online payment system, which is a public digital infrastructure that allows to uh, be independent, or at least strategically autonomous, from uh, from large uh, tech corporations, and no one here has anything against large tech corporations, but uh, the fact that one is totally dependent from anyone is never something that one would advise to a friend. So it's always good to think about strategical autonomy and to start to to understand and this conception of good digital sovereignty in terms of understanding the technology, being able to develop it and regulate it, is essential to be strategically autonomous. Now, speaking about digital public goods, I think that uh, no one better than the next speaker about speaking about the, the digital public goods alliances uh, can tell us. Sorry, Marietta, just, I see just we Just before Leia starts, I just want to welcome the online participants. There are not many of them. I don't know who they are. Maybe they're on a boat in the Pacific somewhere because if they're anywhere else, they have no business being awake. But we do have around um, 15, maybe 12 minus the tech team. So welcome, and please use the chat. I'm monitoring the chat, um, and thanks for being with us. Fantastic, thank you very much, and welcome also to the online participants, not only all the participants here, of course, but also the online participants. So now we have Leah Gimpel from the AI, that is AI and Country Policy Lead at Digital Public Goods Alliance. Please, Leah. Thank you so much, Luca, and thank you to this distinguished uh, panel for uh, being part of this discussion. I think it's uh, really timely that PIX was already mentioned because uh, digital public infrastructure is definitely something that has uh, a huge overlap with digital public goods, but perhaps I start by uh, telling you a bit more about the concept of digital public goods, what the Digital Public Goods Alliance is, and then move uh, on to digital public infrastructure to use all the buzzwords uh, here. Um, the Digital Public Goods Alliance is a multi-stakeholder alliance that is endorsed by the United Nations to uh, help the discoverability, investment in, and uh, use of digital public goods, uh, especially for low- and middle-income countries, to help attain uh, the sustainable development goals. So what are digital public goods? Um, basically, in 2019, Antonio Guterres urged uh, everyone, um, so stakeholders from the private sector, from the public sector, as well as civil society, and everyone else to promote open source software, open content, open data, open standards, and open AI models to help reduce the fragmentation in the digital uh, ecosystem and uh, ensure more efficiency. And that is um, essentially also the definition uh, that we use uh, for digital public goods. And what they all have in common is that uh, they are open source, they do no harm, 
and they uh, are focused on uh, reaching the sustainable development goals. And we have these uh, like five categories of products. Um, so just to repeat, uh, open source software, open uh, AI models, open standards, open content, and open data. And as a digital public goods alliance, we basically do two things. Uh, first of all, we advocate for uh, this kind of concept and help especially low and middle income countries uh, to use uh, digital public goods for their public service delivery. And secondly, we also maintain the DPG standard uh, and the DPG registry. So the DPG standard is basically um, a set of nine indicators that we use to assess if any given product uh, is, can be considered a digital public good. Um, we have a submission platform on our website where you as a product developer can apply for the DPG uh, label, so to say. And it's basically like an insurance for donors, for governments and others that these products are vetted, that they are open source uh, according to several standards. Um, and that they help attain the SDGs. And currently we have more than 150 products on the digital public goods registry on our website, which you can actually go through and also um, basically map to the sustainable development goals. So if you are interested, for instance, in, um, in education and making sure that no one is left behind there, you can go to the registry and find all the DPGs, so all the open source software and other components, such as also open educational resources and uh, see which ones are registered uh, to exactly fit this purpose. And in the second part, I would like to shed a bit of light on the evolving topics in the DPG ecosystem. And one was already mentioned, that is digital public infrastructure. So uh, Renata mentioned PICS um, from a DPG perspective that is, uh, strictly speaking, not a digital public good at the moment, but we hope that it's going to be in the future because it's not open source, but it's basically a means um, yeah, to, uh, to help uh, give countries uh, sovereignty over, over their own infrastructure. And that is also what DPGs are made for, so that you as a, as a country, as an implementer, can use DPGs uh, yourself, uh, adapt them, adopt them, um, extend them if you want, and also choose a vendor uh, that you would like to work with in order to implement these. And if you are not happy with that vendor, you can uh, go to another vendor uh, and build uh, your, your infrastructure. And at the same time, as a country, of course, you also have the possibility to develop your own vendor ecosystem, uh, to create jobs, for instance, uh, to help uh, implement products that you are either developed in your own country or uh, that you um, yeah, adopt as a country, uh, such as a huge uh, DPG, such as DHIS2, which is a um, management information platform. But coming back to digital public infrastructure, um, from our definition, that's basically a set of four um, really basic components of a country's um, yeah, IT architecture, so to say. It's a payment system, such as a PIX. It's um, digital identity. It's um, civil registries. And it's data exchange. And uh, as a Digital Public Goods Alliance, we work with a number of products that actually fulfill also this um, prospect, this purpose of being open source in order to ad be adoptable by everyone. Um, so products such as Mossip, for instance, uh, Moja Loop, uh, and Xroad are examples of these kind of tools that you can use to build your own digital public infrastructure. And what all of these have in common is that they are not a tiny, you know, open source project, but they are, that they are actually uh, have multiple uh, country implementations already under their belt. So a lot of experience of what is working in a specific country and what is not. And one of the main purposes of the Digital Public Goods Alliance is as well to help exchange country experiences. So basically help other countries to adopt these kind of products and develop you know, their own control over their digital destiny, as Renata uh, said it so, so nicely. And uh, as a second part, I just uh, want to quickly also elaborate on open source AI and AI systems as digital public goods, because obviously given the current dynamics, that's a huge topic for us as a DPG as well, um, because we also figured that probably the DPG standard needs to evolve in a way that AI systems are fit better, and also given, of course, the dynamics around large language models and generative AI. And here, I think one of the main challenges is the yeah, current power imbalances and concentration of powers that we see in the current ecosystem. And um, as a Digital Public Goods Alliance, we, of course, would like to contribute to democratizing AI in several ways. Um, I mean, there's first, of course, the uh, use of AI, there's the democratizing of the development of artificial intelligence so that it's not just happening in the global north in very specific contexts. 
and then also the benefits, democratizing the benefits and governance of artificial intelligence systems. And as a DPGA, we basically explore currently in a community of practice that is co-hosted of UNICEF, the overlap between responsible openness, because obviously not every AI system is fit for being released in the public domain completely, um, but we need to have safeguards uh, around this as well. And in our um, community of practice, what we, what we developed is, is an approach that you can say is a created or gradient approach to the openness of AI systems. Um, which means that we um, basically break down an AI system and its main components being data, being models, and uh, being uh, the code, uh, so the inference and training code for AI systems, and then look at all of these components independently and define which of these should be open or closed or in between uh, to, in order for a product to be considered a DPG, because obviously it is, it's not a black and white debate, but there's a gray shade in between being completely open and being closed or proprietary. And uh, since data was mentioned, uh, just to give you a little sneak peek, uh, so to say, um, for the data component, we are actually allowing the most leeway because it's also the most content contested um, layer of an AI system when it comes to openness. So what we basically define as a way to be aspirational openness. So for instance, to have synthetic data sets that are modeled on the original data set or to have a, a hosted access to the AI training data, um, which will help in the combination with a model that is mostly open, including model weights, architecture and such, and um, the code that needs to be open source to ensure that the benefits of, of open source, so being transparent, being reusable, being extensible, is still um, part uh, or it can be realized by this AI DPGs. That's an approach that we are currently discussing, so if you have any opinion on that, happy to elaborate either in the session uh, or later on afterwards. And in a nutshell, the work that the DPGA does really has country experience, country digital sovereignty at its heart because we believe that countries need to have control over their own uh, digital infrastructure in order to deliver uh, digital services at scale and cater to their populations. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lea. And actually, it's very interesting. I think the work of the Alliance is very interesting because it uh, aims at mapping what exists and creating a sort of repository of what exists. So that is something already very beneficial because there is there are no many or organizations that do so around the world, although many people are interested in this. You don't know where to look at to understand what exists already. And then the, the other point that you stressed that I really like, and I think it's very interesting for the conversation of today and the other conversations we will have or along this week, it's the connection between uh, digital sovereignty and AI, actually another piece of uh, very uh, uh, directed advertisement. We will present another book on AI sovereignty, transparency, and accountability on the second, on, on the day two. Uh, and a part of it is precisely dedicated to, uh, to, the cons to how digital sovereignty can be baked into the conception of AI sovereignty and the kind of layered approach that you need to have because if we only look at regulation of AI as risk, it's, it's important, but you, you run the risk to only look at the tree and not the forest. You have to look at all the layers from that data to, to compute, and we will speak about everything on, uh, on day two at 5.30 if you're interested, plus there will be free copies of the books. Uh, but after this very uh, direct <laughs> uh, advertisement, I think we, it, now it's time to open for some comments and reactions because we already have some very interesting comments from the uh, online attendants. Uh, so if you have any comments, now we can have uh, five to 10 minutes, maybe 10 minutes to have some initial reactions from the audience and uh, also from the participants online. Um, so I have a comment here from Timothy Holborn from Australia. I forgot the Australians are awake, like a typical South African, I overlooked the Australians. Um, and he is raising the very important point about the, the supply chains and the ecosystems of creating um, digital public goods. And he's saying that there needs to be recognition of the, the effort, the labor of people who build the commons. Um, and how they can benefit from those um, um, directly. Um, 
He says digital sovereignty at a rule um, of law level is quite important, but also human-centric. Yeah, systems need to support info orgs or personal selfhood systems where personal agents can make use of permissive comments. Comments artifacts that may be about a relationship between two people. In other words, he's, he's, he's actually adding to, to the complexity of this ecosystem. And then he says he wonders how policy now seeks to support personal ontology management. I wonder if you're an academic, um, um, Timothy. But and, and I think for me, just the question that this brings uh, up as well, which I hope the other speakers can also address, is how do you uh, uh, recognize the role of of, of, of the public sector, of the state, without creating a new paradigm of top-down control. So how do, you, how do you mobilize the public sector and the role of the state to protect the commons without it actually taking over um, and capturing um, the commons? Um, corporate capture and state capture, how do, we, how do we avoid that? Any other comments from the, from the room? You can go and stand at the mic. Yeah, so we have two comments here, three. So just line up behind okay, the mic. Let's take this three, uh, and you can line uh, there at four. Okay, let's take this four, and then, <laughs> and then we will proceed with the next mm -hmm. segment. Yes, and you can. I can, if I can ask you to introduce yourself, so that for the for the transcripts also we know who you are, and and then we can proceed. Yes, definitely. Uh, I am Alexandre Costa Barbosa. I am a fellow at the Weizenbaum Institute, and also a coordinator of the Brazilian Homeless Workers Movement Technology Sector. Really glad to see this table, Professor Luca Belli, Renata, Anita, other colleagues. Uh, I'd like just to, to share with the other audience here that we've launched uh, recently a booklet on digital sovereignty led by social movements, which I think is completely re related to thinking of this so-called new commons, right? This local community-based uh, co governance of of commons pool resources, right? Uh, so I think Professor Lucabelli, I ha actually have a dream, you know, like one day we will see like uh, community networks or even social movements being on main sessions of Internet Governance Forum, not to showcase uh, successful digital inclusion uh, initiatives, but actually to draw concrete lessons for global digital governance. But uh, my question it's related to digital public goods and digital public infrastructure, actually. Because uh, PIX, for instance, was funded, uh, was an initiative that, w that came out of from the Brazilian Central Bank, from its own laboratory for promoting this kind of technology. But I remember, like in France, the, the French Central Bank, they are developing their own digital infrastructure, like a repository, an inventory for uh, carbon emissions, to support uh, ESG and so on, but it is not considered as public digital infrastructure. So I'd like to hear a bit more how uh, you come up with like digital ID, uh, payment methods, uh, tax or consent-based uh, sharing, data sharing platforms as the digital public infrastructure per se, because I don't think that's enough. Yeah? I'd like to, to hear a bit more on that. Thank you very much. Shall I? Yeah. Okay. yeah, we can we can take all the comments and then have maybe some quick replies and then go on. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is José Renato, I'm also from Brazil. I am an advisor at the Laboratory of Public Policy and Internet, LAPIN, an NGO there. Um, yeah, it has actually a great, uh, a huge connection with what um, Alexandre said, because one of the main things that I, that I missed in the presentations was, okay, we were talking about digital identity, uh, having more control over data and et cetera, and technological development as a whole. But we have an issue also with physical infrastructure, if I may call it that way, like I'm talking about data centers, I'm talking about um, satellites. We have a huge issue in Amazon, for instance, I do that. So I would like to know a bit more of your view in these issues and, and maybe also a glimpse of what's the state role in promoting these initiatives. And just to add upon that, also how do you see the, the, the role of the state in fomenting um, community-based solutions for sovereignty? I think that the movement, uh, the homeless movement in Brazil is a great exam uh, example of that. But yeah, 
maybe hearing some comments on these two topics. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Astha Kapoor. I'm the co-founder of Apti Institute. Uh, hello to the friends on the panel. I guess uh, a quick question, well, two questions. One is, I think that, um, and, and Leah, this may be for you, is that when we think about digital public infrastructure, so much of it is being built out of India, for instance, and we've all learned the lessons from that. But how do we think about interoperability? Because at the moment, UP and PICs don't talk to each other. So the idea of those, and you know, India is on trying to uh, export or, or build digital public infrastructure over different parts of the world? Um, and then how do we really think about those solidarities? And then moving from solidarities is also the idea of commons. We have so many bottom-up mechanisms, but they are happening in isolated boundaries of the nation state because, again, there is no way for these movements, this data, to talk to one another. So the tussle between the state fund sovereignty uh, sort of goes antithetical to some of the infrastructure that's being built and also the notion of commons. Hi everyone, my name is Al. Um, I work for the Tor project, which might be a good example of an existing digital public good and a piece of infrastructure that's been around for almost two decades now. And I'm curious what people think about how we fund the existence of digital public goods once they are in the world. And if we're really thinking about the antithesis of value hoarding and big tech and you know, digital products that make money, essentially, how do we make sure that these things continue to exist once they are in the world and used by millions of people? I see a lot of amazing projects fighting over scraps, essentially, in this funding landscape, and uh, I think it, it's complicated. There are, there are some cool things that are happening, but um, I'd love to hear more about what the panel thinks about how we keep these things alive once they exist and uh, what kind of money we make that happen with. Thanks. Hi, uh, hi everyone, my name is Sherpa. I'm a PhD candidate at University of Melbourne. Um, my question actually comes from my research and my during my stay at Australia. I realized that, you know, the principle of self-determination, as we all understand, you know, one of the principles that uh, international law and international legal system exist on. It's, it's, it's actually very differently interpreted based on which, where, which jurisdiction you go. And I was surprised that you know Australia doesn't have one. And because of which the indigenous people over there cannot protect their right even if they want to, including their data. And I, th and I thought that that's, that's the kind of a problem that exists in many countries, including India. Because I, was, I came to know that you know, there was this one particular of uh, uh, one particular company that was collecting data of like poor people, telling them that, you know, oh, you are getting, uh, like, you know, it's your data, you're getting participated, but then how are they gonna control that data? My question is that, you know, when, when we talk about digital commons, we are, it, if, if we continue with this practice, I think, I think it will soon become a tool, a tool of exploitation. So I think that the, the, the concept I mean, before we move on to discussing the digital commons, we need to first talk about self-determination because these people need to be able to control. Uh, otherwise, it's just this digital gap, the gap, and the the whole the the, the this era. The, the, there'll be a new era of colonization, I believe. Thank you. All right, we have a lot of very interesting comments. Uh, my suggestion that we have maybe a quick round of replies uh, from from anyone from the, the, the panel, and then we proceed with the next segment of uh, panelists that actually many of them will plug into the comments that have been shared. Uh, one question. One more question, one more question. Okay, one so, more question online. Um, um, Timothy, can you um, unmute yourself and um, speak? Am I, am I, Great. Uh, are you able to hear me? We hear you clearly. Am I coming through? Wonderful. Um, look, I've been working for a very long period of time through the W3C to create open standards technology to, put to, to support uh, freedom of thought and rule of law. So as we migrate away from these environments where we had a vault of all of our important p papers, the sorts of things that we need to walk into a court of law and say, Your Honour, peacefully, I would like to resolve this dispute. 
this is what verifiable claims and credentials and the things that you call identity were produced to create. But the underlying infrastructure to make sure that people can store all this information and operate their own artificial intelligent agents so that the microphones and sensors aren't going outside of your house, but certainly have a role with your door locks and your lights and your life and your children and everything else. So how, whilst there may be different ideologies, much like the United Nations agreements speak about the freedom of religion, some people may well want to be defined by their wallets, but other people want to be defined by what they do. And so to do that, we need to create a lot of infrastructure, commons infrastructure, and commons may be the common relationship between two people, which is based upon agreements between those two people, even when the, when the relationship between two people or more than two people change. So how are we building the infrastructure to support our human rights, at least as an option, through these different modals, where the artificial intelligent agent that is your prosthetic extension of self in society has a meaningful relationship with you as a human being, not someone else who wants to make use of you as a, as a natural resource for profit and or mitigating any risks that may occur. You know, if, if indeed our public institutions do not want to make a, diff, a distinction between good people and bad ones. So there's a different sort of um, structure to what is able to be made possible. I might also note that large language models are quite different to logical pro programming in relation to things like properly encoding language and languages and building what is called in psychology personal ontology. And so I just wanted to um, highlight that. I also wanted to highlight that the volume of work is, is significant. Um, and I'm currently working through uh, the idea of producing through the 110 chapters or so in internet society, some basic fa you know, foundational framework to be able to support things like digital prisons, because I think we needed an alternative to Facebook, um, to, to support the needs of refugees, to support the needs of people whose future is unknown unless we can get the knowledge in the evidentiary sense to a court of law where peaceful decisions are able to be made. I hope that helps. Thanks, Timothy. And um, if anyone's online or want to log in, Timothy has posted some very useful links in the Zoom chat. Anybody want to respond to Renata? Yeah, I think Blair. Yeah, let me maybe start with the basics, so the uh, definition uh, of DPI that I put forward. Um, so our main guiding point here is uh, infrastructure that has society-wide functions, and that's why we land at these four. But obviously there are other important parts of a country's uh, digital stack that need to be in place in order to run it safe and securely. Um, but we believe by focusing on these four components, we actually enable an informed discussion and um, really help guide uh, also resources into building out these basic components. I think. I mean, this is still an evolving uh, definition. Others have broader uh, definitions, but we are here with the World Bank uh, on the DPI definition. I think what another useful approach to think of for DPI is, is the building blocks approach. And that is something, for instance, that the GovStack initiative is developing. Um, so basically defining the core building blocks for specific services and uh, yeah, pieces of a country stack that, that you need uh, for digital governance initiatives. And um, for instance, GovStax has a lot of building blocks, around 30, I think, currently, with um, um, the specifications. Um, some of them would fall into our definition of digital public infrastructures or relating to digital ID, for instance, or data exchange. Others are smaller components that you, for instance, need to deliver on a sectoral use case. And that's the main definition. Uh, or the differentiation, uh, so to say, so society-wide functions versus sectoral use cases. Obviously, for sectors, you also have foundational pieces of infrastructure that need to be in place. And in terms of the question of interoperability and you know uh, having products that speak to each other, I mean, as a DPHA, we are committed to open source. So what we want to see is that technology is not only developed by countries themselves, but that in, in an ideal scenario, it's also shared openly and experience is shared and then these components are built 
uh, based on operability standards, open standards, etc., to help uh, that these different components can speak to each other and be adopted. And what, so basically what we want to see less of are these bilateral agreements that some countries currently do in order to share their technologies towards sharing their technology really in the public domain as a commons and then help others to adopt it. Um, I'll just respond quickly. Uh, you go first, Renata. I always forgot. Uh, just a word. Um, I completely agree with Alexandre uh, when he said we have to have more social movements speaking for himself, for themselves in this kind of panel. And um, uh, I agree too when he says the PIX is not a digital common, uh, a public uh, uh, technology because it's not open source and there is a lot of uh, things, but it's a public policy that uh, effectively democratize the, the, uh, the, the commercial transition and um, has an important goal to the sovereignty uh, uh, in our country. And in Brazil, uh, I just want to underline this, we have lived through the last six years uh, under governments that did not have any agenda of sovereignty, and uh, much less in the digital uh, term. So um, we have to start from the beginning. In, and uh, there are a lot of to do, and we are talking about, uh, in this moment, uh, about uh, how can we face the challenge to uh, have a policy to data centers in our country. We are discussing this in this moment in the, um, our, uh, the, the Ministry of Science and Technology. How can we discuss uh, uh, initiative, initiatives to have our sovereignty uh, uh, of our dat data and uh, this is not simple, and this is something uh, we have to achieve in the long term. It's not a policy that we have the results in the short term, but we are um, we have this compromise to to face this challenge and see what can we do about this. Um, just quickly on the question about interoperability. Um, I think, well, firstly, I think digital public infrastructure is actually a very useful new concept that is existing or emerging in our internet governance space. And I think it's a good opportunity to look at collaboration between different stakeholders, between communities, civil society organizations, businesses and government actually working together to define common definitions, but also principles on which to, to, to regulate, uh, where there's a need for regulation, and to be interoperable. I must say in Africa, we have a new data policy framework, the African Union Commission, um, member states adopted a very high-level framework um, on data policy, which actually um, enables data sovereignty without data localization in a way that would restrict trade or, or harm freedom of expression. Um, I think the example of MOSIP, the, the, um, the Indian open source digital identity system is also a very good example. But you need frameworks and you need principles and you need collaboration. So I think um, uh, the, this, this, this interoperability also has a political and a political will component that we, that we cannot, and a component of collaboration. And just finally on regulation for, for more community-based ownership. I think currently our whole regulatory paradigm in internet governance is shaped by big companies and trying to create some kind of level playing field in the European Digital Services, Digital Markets Act, in that sense is a good response. But we also need regulation that enables diversity and that creates more open markets that, that are more open to community initiative, to smaller players. So I think we... we well, finally, I just do think we can use this DPI discussion as a way of, 
of trying to rethink some of the, the um, ruts that we have um, fallen into with our approaches to internet governance. Look. Just, just a quick comment before we end, we'll give the floor to Anita, just to uh, help the, the participants also to have a little bit more clarity because we are speaking about a lot of different things now and just to put uh, again the discussion into at least three main pillars that are emerging here. The, the digital commons that are really about resources and communities that self-govern a specific resource that can be a digital resource. The digital public goods or digital public infrastructures that have a lot of points of overlap with the digital commons, but usually are see a role of the government, of a public entity, fostering, thinking about them, and, and even promoting them, like the PICs, if you want. Uh, they both overlap, and actually the government has a, a role in protecting the digital commons, and digital commons can help enormously the development of digital public infrastructures. And both represent two very good examples of how you can reclaim digital sovereignty, meaning not being dependent for, from, from the ecosystems and the digital structures that large tech corporations that usually are very few and, and very concentrated, uh, develop and through which they technically regulate the, the digital development of the world. The comment that was made about AI and compute is a very good one, and uh, that, uh, that is a very good point that we analyze here, the fact that there are basically three large corporations that provide uh, cloud computing for AI to the entire world. Uh, well, we can name them because there is nothing, there is not shaming, it's just naming uh, AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. Then there is a little bit of emerging Chinese uh, uh, tech giants like Alibaba and, 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 and Tencent, but otherwise you have basically 70% of the market concentrated in three cloud providers that define cloud computing for AI in the world. So that is something that <laughs> needs to be tackled. I'm very happy to hear that. And actually, I think that one of the best things that the Brazilian government did was also to uh, reopen the, the program to uh, to promote the the uh, development of uh, semiconductors in Brazil. It was something that the previous government wanted to s to sell, <laughs> and that was the only production of semiconductors from semiconductors in Latin America. <laughs> it was really not strategic to sell it. But anyway, we will speak about all this uh, maybe today and in for sure on, on 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 Tuesday. Now let's give the floor to Anita because a lot of what we say about digital public infrastructures and digital public goods comes from Indian evolutions over the past 10 years. So please, Anita, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I just wanted to say we have a little over 20 minutes left and there are three speakers. We, um, but we, we started with 15 or okay. of delay because of the I previous panel started with 15 minutes late, so we have like 35. <laughs> okay, so okay. do we have to hand over yes, the yeah. room to someone else? I'm not very sure. Also, just to say that I, a uh, small caveat is I think I'm not an expert on India. My location is certainly Indian, and I try my best to speak uh, to those experiences. But I thought I would do what um, you know we've been working on for a while, which is the connections between the digital commons and digital sovereignty, and to conceptually put out uh, some thoughts. Of course, as Luca, you mentioned Ostrom's work, and the whole idea of the natural commons and the management of the natural commons is not a new phenomenon. Um, however, the management of the natural commons, you know, has had to deal with systems for different things, you know, maybe lakes or maybe mountains, grasslands, they've all been localized. So when you actually look at the digital, you're talking about a certain idea of scale and therefore finding the contextual integrity of the commons for that scale. And we have, I think, uh, historically for 20 years, uh, going beyond the internet commons, had rules, had systems. We've had systems for the content commons. We've had protocols. We have the open software movements. And now, of course, uh, data and the layers of digital intelligence that are getting built on top of these commons uh, for which systems don't exist, common systems don't exist. And these pertain very much to textual data, which is language and um, other forms of data, including IoT data which we see in uh, LLM models, but not only. Also foundational AI counts on all of these uh, social knowledge uh, commons. 
Of course, as you said, the governance of the commons is key and access and use conditionalities become vital. And um, this is not only because we have to have rules for how to access, who will access, who will use, but also to avert the pollution of the commons, which is a very, very uh, important thing. So what is sovereignty? Sovereignty as self-determination connects the idea of the commons with two things. One, with the process of commoning. So the commons are only as important as commoning. There's no point in having a pristine lake out there which is not of use to humankind. So the idea of the commons with commoning, which is the act of creating, preserving, and nurturing the commons for the purpose of using the resource prudently. And the second is sovereignty connects as self-determination, as one of our friends pointed out, connects also the, to the whole process of communitizing. Communitizing, as is quite evident, you know, you cannot have a community that creates a resource and cares for it, but is divorced from uses of the resource and benefits that arise from the resource, which is exactly how it is with the regime of data, with the de facto regime of data. We seem to create and create and create, and you know, no one seems to care for it, and someone else seems to benefit from it. So commoning and communitizing are therefore processes very, very central to the commons. And I think that enabling a collaborative regime of access, use, benefit sharing, and governance that is about relevant models of democracy, appropriate for the resource under consideration. So commoning and communitization of a resource will pertain to the nature of the resource and cannot be some generic set of principles that are going to be homogeneously applied. Digital policy needs to address not just the creation of the commons, the digital commons, but also the enablement of commoning so that some people don't capture access. The option value of data and the quest for infinite aftermarkets has led to a data hoarding with deeply adverse consequences for the digital economy. I think um, suffice it to say that all of us understand what it means. And in order to make sure that communitization and commoning are not divorced or decoupled, policy needs to ensure harm prevention and redistributive justice. I think this is indeed the role of the state. It's a very tricky role because the commons has always been, certainly uh, through crony capitalism, you know, uh, been very conveniently exploited by the state for certain purposes. So the challenges that face us essentially link to one of openness that does not necessarily lead to commoning. And second challenge that we are con confronted with is the highly disembedded imaginaries of communities that do not recognize the role of public goods and the rule of law in ensuring the connection between public goods and the commons. So we get into endless hair splitting about is this commons, is this public goods, is this d you know, DPIs, etc. I think it is important to recognize that it's not possible for for instance, low-income neighborhoods that manage their own slum communities in India, in, in, in a place like Dharavi in Bombay, where it's not possible for them to have their own water supply, ha have their own internal systems, because the commons of their housing has to be managed in relation to the public goods that are provisioned by the government. So public goods in relation to the commons are not just a kind of privilege, but they are part of the duty of the state to provide, which is why the example of PICS or of UPI in India become very, very vital. So I think these relationships between self-determination, sovereignty, commons, and public goods have to always be kept in mind because it's a process of fine-tuning, calibrating how these relationships will actually work. We have in the realm of data innumerable principles. We have the fair data principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. These have been uh, critiqued for some kinds of limitations, you know, for instance, that they do facilitate greater data sharing, but do not pay adequate attention to the power differentials and equity in data sharing and reuse. We also have the criticism that the fair use principles, like, you know, let's actually have federated systems. I'll give you your privacy, but I will take your data. You know, that's the larger model. Such approaches enable private sector actors to engage in free riding. So then there has been, in, in the realm of, uh, you know, academia and practice, the whole idea of the care principles. And these are originally developed from indigenous data resources, connecting back to the Nagoya principles of the Convention of Biological uh, Diversity. And these, of course, connect to data ecosystems and their collective benefits. 
collective control of data systems, and reuse uh, principles that actually um, inherit in collective benefit. Well, the care principles are very important because they do push for communitization. They do push for self-determination and communitization. But there's one more vital connection between commons, community, and sovereignty, and that is not only linked to sovereignty as territory or sovereignty as knowledge, but so sovereignty also as embodiment, and this comes from feminist thinking. And here I think that we really need to understand that the resource governance questions around data or AI cannot really look at the commons as some kind of dematerialized, abstract idea, but as an idea that's extremely particularized and embodied. And that, I think, is a very, very vital connection. It's not very easy because you're dealing with a resource, you're dealing with principles of territory, you're dealing with uh, principles of knowledge, and you're dealing with principles of embodiment. So again, there's a lot of complexity in the management of uh, the commons of data. I'd just like to uh, wrap up with uh, a couple of comments. One is that sovereignty is implicated not only in the terms in which human bodies are dematerialized into a resource for digital capitalism, but equally when they get rematerialized into a large language model or rematerialized in the form of a basic AI model, we really have to look at how this has material impacts on our ability and means to choose our life course, which is called the equality of autonomy. And that's why self-determination is not only about management of the resource, but self-determination is also about the accountability to the human beings who are part of the commoning. So this is uh, really important, and I think um, this uh, cannot be forgotten. Uh, finally, to address my issue around um, you know, openness and its limits, and also the whole question of what is to be done to govern the um, systems of commons, and what are the institutional systems of governance in the digital commons, a few points. I think that digital resources you know, like uh, a data bank or a local seed bank with informational uh, you know, databases where there is a certain pooling of seeds that farmers do, et cetera. You, know, you might have a biodiversity register to accompany that. All of this, you know, these really require some kind of state support. I think you really need to also endorse these. You need to support these. And you also need to uh, create uh, standards and protocols, which are public goods. And finally, I think that the provisioning of the public goods, as I said, is really the duty of the state in the digital era. It cannot be wished away. And um, I think the elephant in the room is really not just the governance of the commons, but the governance of the non-commons, which basically means governance of the capitalist systems, regulation of the capitalist systems that poach the commons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, really, for this fantastic overview of also how all these dimensions interact and intersect from the individual to the community to the state. And also something uh, that uh, we analyzed in other work, it's about that there is the fact that there is, if, when there is no individual community or state sovereignty, there is a corporate digital sovereignty, which is because there is, you know, as the Romans already said thousands of years ago, Ubi societies, ibi use. When there is society, there is regulation. And if you if you don't have individuals asserting their sovereignty, if you have you don't have community doing it, if you don't have the state doing it, there will be someone else, some private ordering acting. And so that is also a very much uh, something that we have to, to keep in mind. Uh, something that actually is very good to create a connection between what you were saying, the individuals and the community create a value that then is hoovered by corporations is i think comes from <laughs> the next speaker uh, from ziski from from wikipedia because also we have seen a lot of the latest generative ai <laughs> being built by basically hoovering wikipedia <laughs> at large so please ziski the floor is yours thank you thank you so much for having me join this panel i'm ziski i'm part of the global advocacy team from the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the nonprofit organization that hosts Wikipedia and other free knowledge projects. I really love that I'm following the speaker because there's very thought-provoking concepts. And there's this saying within the Wikimedia community that Wikipedia is a thing that shouldn't work in theory, no matter what wonderful theories we have about the commons and how they should operate. And it only works in practice. 
So I'm gonna start with a little audience Q&A to make sure that everybody is still awake and alive as we near the end of the session. Um, could you please raise your hand if you have visited Wikipedia, read an article on Wikipedia before? This is what I like to see. This is what I hope to see. Now keep your hands up if you have edited Wikipedia before. All right, I'm assuming, I was assuming this was gonna be a biased sample, but this still makes me really happy that in this room we have a lot of hands raised, thank you. And now everybody again, raise your hands if you already knew that it is possible to edit Wikipedia. Absolutely beautiful. So like I said, this is a very biased sample in this room, but I still like to ask because one of the greatest challenges that my team, and I have two wonderful colleagues sitting right here, if maybe you wanna wave your hand so people can follow you after, yes, so reluctant. One of the biggest challenges that we find is that most people actually aren't familiar with how Wikipedia and other free knowledge projects work. And when I say people, I also mean government officials, legislators, very influential policy makers. And I think that's because we're relics of the early internet days. And by we, I mean Wikimedia projects, including but not limited to Wikipedia, but also really any project that's dedicated to the idea of both free access to knowledge, and maybe more importantly, to this idea of communal ownership and creation of information, resources, and technology, otherwise known as the digital commons in this room. And that lack of awareness is maybe understandable because we're 20 plus years into those early web 2.0 days and the internet looks really different right now and as do the conversations about how to regulate it, how to shape it, and who gets to participate in these processes. The world heavily relies on one dominant type of online service as we've heard a lot from this panel and that is for profit and advertisement driven. And in my experience, when I start talking to people that I work at Wikipedia, maybe we're in a shared Uber together or something, even though they're my age, they probably had teachers telling them not to use Wikipedia in the classroom, they still can't believe it when I tell them that it is an online space that they can be part of creating. And the problem is it seems absent, as I said, in many of our policy and governance discussions as well. Instead, these discussions reflect an anxiety about how to deal with commercial interests, as well as the ability of bad actors to amplify harmful content online. And those are important topics that we definitely need to come up to solutions for, but there's really a lack of proactive action that's being taken to promote a positive vision of the internet. Instead, I think we're really focused on what we want to prevent, but we could also be talking about what we want to create together. And if Luca has been plugging all of his books, I will do the same to plug a workshop that we're running on Wednesday to talk about proactive visions of the internet. So please come find us uh, if you wanna participate. But this kind of anxiety that's dominating these conversations is also very much part of the conversations taking place around emerging technologies like AI. Most AI governance discussions are focused on making sure that this field isn't also captured by commercial interests, again, as we've heard on the panel and that it doesn't amplify racist biases and existing inequalities. And again, that's a good thing. But I think that Wikipedia and other players in the free knowledge movement, such as those that support the commons, are uniquely positioned at this time to raise the values of participation and also to share concrete learnings in these conversations about the governance of emerging technologies and what that might look like from a more bottom-up perspective. So let's take Wikipedia and AI as a case study. Just top of my head, Luca definitely didn't ask me to do that. So we know that Wikimedia is not known for producing any kind of revolutionary, game-changing technology. If you've read a Wikipedia article, you probably have noticed that we're largely using the same software as back in 2002. But that's also kind of the point. We're still here. We're still providing a public good. We're not stealing your data as part of that. We're not selling your data and we're not asking you for money or putting our content behind paywalls. And there's more than 300,000 volunteers around the world, just to give you a sense of the scale, who are working on creating this public interest infrastructure, which is being read around 6,000 times a second and exists across 300 languages. So I think it's fair to say that our model, even if our software is really old, our model is resilient. 
and we have been committed to creating freely accessible information through processes that are participatory, transparent, and also open to everyone. And this commitment is what shapes how we think about emerging technologies like AI. These are tools that must have people's interests and participation at their core. So technologies like AI are going to support human rights and inevitably the public interest when they support the work that humans do on our platforms instead of replacing that work. Wikipedia volunteers have long used AI tools and bots to help scale their own activities, and those are really important things like detecting vandalism or translating content. When these tools are built by the foundation, then we do so in consultation with the very people using it. We want to know if editors are trying to combat a disinformation challenge that they're seeing across a particular language project or a particular topic, then we want to know exactly what those challenges are and how we're going to end up helping them. They are obviously our strongest partners in considering the context-specific effects of AI, like on these small language communities, as an example. So any AI tool that we develop is also going to be open source and transparent so that others can use those tools and improve them. So whether you're editing an article about the digital commons or trains, whatever floats your boat, or you're working on AI, our model's always gonna be the same. Volunteers work together to create the tools that will serve their needs through processes of discussion, debate, and consensus. But don't get me wrong, our model is absolutely not perfect. At a time when Wikipedia plays an essential role in training almost every large language model, we need to be transparent and also proactive about the biases and limitations of the open access infrastructure and processes. So as Luca alluded to, almost every large language model out there right now was trained on Wikipedia data, and it is almost always the largest source of training data in their data sets. But as most people I'm sure in this room know, open access does not mean equal access. Our projects reflect broader structures of power and privilege and patterns of exclusion as a result. And these are gonna impact the type of knowledge that's hosted on our projects. So some examples to think through. Participation is gonna be limited first, but to those who have time, who speak the right languages that are hosted online, and who also have a stable internet connection, which we heard can also come down to physical infrastructure challenges or barriers. Also, your government's policies might influence your ability to write freely about a certain topic. And even if you can contribute, there may be harassment or bullying once you enter our projects. Our own human rights impact assessment found that underrepresented communities experience the majority of harassment online, which disproportionately affects women and racial and ethnic minorities. And on top of all that, you have the very fun problem of what counts as a reliable source. So here we're dealing with existing knowledge gaps whose knowledge has been documented in the right way with the right licensing and published in the right journals or newspapers to count as credible. But we take on our responsibility as a steward for one of the world's largest online platforms by working closely with our volunteer community to address those challenges. So we work to foster a welcoming culture and engage newcomers to our projects. Maybe this is this process of commenting that we heard about. This includes things like a recently ratified universal code of conduct and also technical features that make it easier to start editing uh, perhaps ancient software. We also conduct human rights due diligence as I referenced to understand the impacts that our projects have. And we work to identify and fill knowledge gaps through a variety of forms. So we're urging those who build large language models to do the same. Generative AI tools need to keep humans in the loop for their own interests. It's even been shown that large language, mo language models trained on the output of other large language models become measurably worse. So they always need knowledge that's been produced by actual humans. Clear and consistent attribution is one of the ways that these tools should include recognition and reciprocity for the human contributions that they are built on. And we also ask that creators of large language models embrace increased transparency in the sources of their training data, how that data is weighed, and the resulting outputs to help us understand and assess the information from their products. So if there's something that we know from our 20 plus years, it's that people are essential to the longevity and integrity of the information ecosystem. AI should aid people in sharing and participating in knowledge, not replace them. Thanks, thanks, Siski. 
and um, we are um, over time, but we started a little bit late. There's not another session in this room, so if people are able to stay for another 10 minutes, please do. Baka. And then we'll hopefully have some time for discussion as well. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, I want to take my time so I can be as short as possible. Uh, I, I want to uh, highlight one of the process that in our experience is, is, is the most, or one of the most important uh, thing to uh, actually, like, uh, and like, like you said, the communalization of the, of the digital common goods. No? So we need to understand that it is a process always. No? No, it is not like, like a place in which we will be there some, some, some time, but like a process in which we learn every time, every time we are learning, and we make mistakes, and we learn again. And capacity building is one of these processes in which communities can rethink, can analyze, can reflect about their own uh, challenges and the, the and how the technologies can be used for the uh, for their needs, for their dreams, etc. And as as uh, some people here know, I always talk about uh, the experience we have in, in doing doing things and trying to to learn from uh, the communities. So uh, we will have another session in the in the afternoon about community networks. So people who, who are interested in this topic, we can have uh, more conversation in, on it. We will have also uh, different uh, panelists. But I will try to focus on this aspect of the community networks. So uh, all the learnings that I, I am sharing now is, is from two different uh, training programs. One of it is a training program for coordinators of ICT networks in indigenous and rural communities in Latin America that we have been developing with the ITU since uh, 2019, it's a blended program. It has uh, five online courses and then a uh, boot camp, 10-day boot camp that we will be developing this year in Guatemala. And it has not only uh, training in, uh, you know, how to install or develop a network, but also in indigenous communities and community communication. Uh, we have a lot of training in, in broadcasting, for example. And the other experience that, uh, that we uh, accompany with, with other organizations in, in different parts of the world are the National Schools of Community Networks that has been play, taking place since uh, 2020 in five countries, Indonesia, Na Kenya, Nigeria, uh, South Africa, uh, Brazil, and yes, it is the five. And uh, uh, we have the support from the uh, FCDO from the UK, and we have been coordinated it in a in an joint effort between APC and Rhizomatica. So what we learn in, in this process? Uh, well, uh, these learnings are very closed or very linked with uh, the community networks itself and, and the goals of the community networks, no? So uh, what capacity building is important because people learn how to install, operate, maintain, and manage their own network. So it can be more sustainable over time, these projects, because the people can repair, can, no, can, can do the things that uh, in other ways they can't do. Uh, other, other thing that it is very important is this critical thinking about the technologies. No? Uh, we said always that uh, we have the right to be connected but uh, some communities also want to, to think how, how to take uh, care of this, of this connection. They don't, they don't want to have access, uh, you know, uh, free access for, for everything. They want to, to think and to reflect about it. And it uh, can uh, develop a process in which the selection of the technologies are more uh, linked with the, with the real needs of the communities. Uh, other, other thing is that the network, the community networks are sustained, uh, very, very related or very linked with the organizational structure of the community. So if the community, for example, have a traditional way, uh, political way of, of living, they introduce the, the network in this way of living, no? it's like the water or, or other kind of, 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 of goods. Uh, the local economy is stringent, uh, through different process, no? uh, through the incorporation of the technologies. Uh, it also uh, happened that 
the community start thinking on how to develop their own content and uh, you know to strengthen their own uh, identity through these through these processes in which they include the technologies and finally uh, this knowledge when we develop these programs are socialized in the community so the community start to think that it is possible to the, it is possible to have another way of of connecting and to have access but 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 it is important one thing and we have developed a lot of mistakes if we think that there is only one way to develop capacity building. No, the capacity building that the community needs needs to be very linked of, with the le ways of learning and the needs of the communities. So uh, the, uh, we need to design the, the capacity building for the communities it, itself, not for, not for all the communities. So. Uh, we depart, for example, from the technological experience of everyone. No, if we want to teach electricity for the for uh, for the person in the communities, almost all have changed. Uh, I, I forgot in English the, the name of the focus. The, the foc the, well, uh, they they have some experience <laughs> dealing with with electricity issues. No, so uh, they go always beyond uh, technical training. No. They always link this technical with other uh, with other things in their territory. For example, uh, they think like uh, the computer, like a human body. No, one of the communities say that ah, we can understand the, the community, the parts like a human body, or uh, we can understand an intranet, a, a closed network, like a lake, like our lake, or no. So there is always a, a link between the communities. And uh, that, and uh, and most uh, important, they breaking paradigms about who can manage and who can deploy and who can uh, coordinate the projects in which uh, through this uh, through this uh, they can access to the technologies. And finally, uh, what is the kind of public <laughs> policies do we need? Uh, it's easier, but it's complex at the same time. No, uh, we need to take in mind that uh, this thing that the the training programs, the development of this kind of capacity building, needs to be particularized and contextualized, and uh, it takes time. No, so one program needs to have the time to design what what the program wants to to develop, and then. We can, uh, we can implement the, the training. So uh, I think this is, this is for me. I, I want to, to make an invitation for you. We have this uh, CN Learning Repository. Uh, this is a Community Network Learning Repository. You will find a lot of materials linked uh, link with community networks. You all can also, and please do, uh, share uh, your own uh, materials in this in this space and uh, see you in the other session in the in the in the evening so thank you very much thanks Barca. <laughs> yes there's a there's a, a session at 11 o'clock on on the the learning um done through community networks and um, some can we take two questions if there are any more questions before you go um i don't see anyone is there a question no well, I, I would like to, I mean, the, the, we always do this with this uh, Digital Commons Forum. We kind of go all over the place. Um, and look at next year, we're going to do it differently, okay. Um, I think what I do want the, 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 the panel to, to, to respond to, maybe Luca, you can do as well. I don't really want us to do closing remarks. But I think maybe if you can come up with something, we're in this moment at the moment, in this particular space, the IGF space, the UN space, we've got the Global the Digital Compact hovering, uh, we've got WISIS plus 20, and then there's also this work that we are all doing, which in a sense exists in different spaces, um, but which is making a difference. And, and there's also the elephant in the room that, that Anita talked about. What do you think that this, 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 this community and these processes that we are involved in at the moment in terms of digital governance, internet governance. What, what, 
would you like to see emerge? You know, what can we do differently or do better um, in this WSIS plus 20 GDC moment that we are in? Or if your response is, let's put our efforts elsewhere and, and uh, 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 do build alternative processes or invest in alternative approaches, um, then please say that. So just a really quick bite-sized comment from all of you, um, starting with you, Leah. Hello, hello. And then you will have Here we go. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks so much. Um, so maybe a key takeaway uh, and uh, related to your question is that we really need to center around people. So uh, I, I really like the idea of building regulation, building digital policies around the commandeering task as well, not only regarding open source technologies for governments uh, and public services, but really empowering people uh, to do this and to take, uh, take on their own destiny, uh, so to say. So I still believe in these processes, but I think that we need to, uh, need to include these perspectives more prominently of the people. Thanks, Lea. Ziski. On a very tactical, practical level, I would really like more shared resources. Like, I want to know what talking points you guys are using when you're showing up in these kinds of spaces so that the next time we're having conversations, we can make sure that we're pushing similar points. And I also want to have access to more case studies and stories that everybody's experiencing in, the own, in their contexts and countries where they're working. I think that would be a really useful way to lift up each other's work. Yeah, we need a knowledge commons around the... <laughs> the Internet as a commons. Uh, I think I think we have to uh, convince our governments that. Uh, ah, okay. Hello. <laughs> I think we have to convince our governments that uh, investing in digital commons and uh, in digital sovereignty is important because um, the main um, perception is that it's more easy and it's more cheaper to buy um, services that are already uh, there and don't develop our own. So it's a convincing process. This is very important for us to initiate this, this space, I don't know. Thank you very much. Anita. Thank you. I think these are times when we have to get real. I think when um, Uber is threatening the European Union and saying we'll exit, the DSA comes into force, bye. So I think we really need to govern in a way that the commons can be legitimized. So I think the governments of the global south should simply make a very big leap in being able to say platform regulation, markets shall be fair, and back one or two digital commons exp experiments in my country, in the south of India, the state of Kerala is setting up an alternative OTT platform. Yes, uh, very quick. I, I think we need to... to have a more uh, policies that are co-designed co by 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 people, no, people who are involved in the in the in the communities that have the challenge to live without connectivity, for example, need to be in in this conversation in different ways. It's not always to sit here in in in, in an IGF, but but we can le we can learn a lot from them, and also to try to des design public policies that that are very. Uh, link with with the with the needs of the communities because if not we will have these big 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 programs in which the communities are not the the re really the targets of this of these processes okay the final word to sum up uh, i think that uh, looking at the past 5 years of internet commons fora I think the, what we have been successful in is to create an interest on the topic that previously was totally absent from IGF discussions. Uh, and that, I think, is the main challenge we still have because uh, I've experienced this working a lot with community networks or even a lot with digital sovereignty over the past years. You have these initial preconceptions due to how 
most people that are in power or everywhere in the world have studied over the past years. So you, we, we think, for instance, that the only way to uh, manage or to have effective governance is state and markets. We don't, uh, people you don't, usually don't even think that there might be a third option that is viable. And I think what we have been good at over the past years is to give a lot of examples that a third option that is viable exists. Although, of course, we cannot, again, think that community networks will defeat Google, <laughs> right? It's, this would be uh, uh, ridiculous. But uh, the, the fact that governments understand that they may, may be a very good uh, op alternative options to foster digital sovereignty and that government themselves understand digital sovereignty not only as authoritarian regimes controlling socially people but to have communities, individuals, states understand how technology works, developing it and being able to effectively regulating it, even pro to protect human rights of the individuals and to protect competition, which are essential to democracy, right? So the fact that we, ha we, we managed to, uh, to, to send this, this message to governments is already, uh, a, a, could be a great success. I'm very sad that today we, wouldn't, we didn't have one of the speakers I've invited, Henri Verdier from the uh, French, uh, he's a French digital ambassador, because they have r r written a very good paper on how digital commons could be good for digital sovereignty. And it's good to see that there are governments that are already understanding this. Uh, there mar I, 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 my, my dream, <laughs> to use an expression not only of Alexander but also <laughs> Martin Luther King, is that, is that more government will understand this. I think that now they are starting to understand it because it, they see there are very good examples of good digital sovereignties from the glo global south, like India, like the peaks in Brazil, that now actually are copied by the global north because the understanding that is a very good way of being strategically autonomous. And uh, so I think that we, are, we have to keep on repeating the message. As any parent know, it's good to repeat the message so the, the, the children understand it and then they, uh, they can uh, implement it in their life. And so maybe sometimes we, sh we should think as the government, as the, our children, that we have somehow to educate with good examples. And if in this perspective, I think we have been uh, pretty much uh, successful over the past years. But of course, there is a lot of room for improvement. Henriette, do you want to have a final, well, final word? I just want to say, maybe this is what we should be looking at with the WSIS plus 20 outcomes. And Anita's um, you know, your idea about governments investing in this, collaborating with other stakeholder groups, um, I think that's a very concrete, deliverable, and I think we can strive to, to, to find a way, um, well, I would hope, to find a way in which the UN system can play a role in facilitating that kind of collaboration in the space. So thanks very much, everyone. Apologies for going over time, um, and we wish you all a very good IGF. Thanks to the online participants and to the interpreters and to our tech team. <laughs>